feel like every day we're rolling the dice to see if we have any technical issues. Try to keep those fingers crossed. As always, feel free to unmute yourself at any time to uh, ask a question or <clears throat> request a clarification on anything. You can also type into the lecture text thread any questions you have. Cody asks, how's everyone's day so far? <clears throat> well, mine's been pretty stressful and uh, it looks like a lot of you all have been having a stressful time as well. Hopefully uh, we'll be able to work together to <clears throat> uh, improve things and all get on the same page. So yeah, for sure, definitely let me know if you have questions as we go through the lecture here. So. <clears throat> Um, last time we were working into chapter 12 and we started talking about syntheses, <clears throat> some strategies for solving synthesis problems. And so I'm going to go through an example here <clears throat> in a really detailed step-by-step -step way. And then we're going to look at some more examples and hopefully that'll get <clears throat> everyone at least a sense for how these problems are, how to work through them. But to be successful with them on exams, it does take a lot of practice. You have to practice the individual reactions so you're familiar with lots of them and practice some synthesis problems. So your brain gets used to seeing how these reactions fit together with one another and starts to recognize when you need the structure of the compound to change, what reactions can be used to do that. <clears throat> So, some strategies <clears throat> for synthesis. One of those strategies is called retrosynthetic analysis. And this is just a fancy way of saying working backwards from the product. So, <clears throat> if I have a reactant that can undergo a variety of reactions, I could make this into a leaving group, I could make it into a nucleophile, and I can get this, oh, I forgot to share my screen. Thank you, Amy. There we go. Join on, everybody. <clears throat> yeah, I just shared it. I wasn't sharing initially. I apologize for that. So hopefully you all can see the screen now. <clears throat> so looking at this example, <clears throat> I've got this OH group, and there are a lot of reactions that an OH group can undergo, right? So there's a lot of things I could do here. I don't know where to start, maybe. So sometimes <clears throat> I want to point out with this example how if you don't know what the react or reactants or reagents or steps are, and you don't know where to start, a lot of times you can start from the product and work backwards because if this functional group, there's maybe only a couple ways to form this, we can start to think about what the last reaction would have needed to be in order to make the final product. So here we're dealing with an alcohol, we're dealing with an alkyne, and alcohols are very common. There's tons of different reactions they undergo. It's hard to necessarily know where to start here. Alkynes are fairly common as well, but we had a short chapter at the end of last semester that dealt with alkynes, and so we know there are only a few different ways to make them. So, <clears throat> first thing I want to do, though, is to look at the carbon skeleton to make sure that whether that, so I recognize whether that is or isn't changing. So if I count the number of carbons on both sides, I can see that <clears throat> the carbon skeleton is not changing. I've got the same four carbons branched on this side and then two more carbons. The only difference is the OH is gone. One of these hydrogens is gone and both of the hydrogens on carbon five are gone. So I've got to eliminate some things to make this alkyne. 
So, <clears throat> as I was saying, <clears throat> if you're not sure how to work forwards, sometimes it's easier to start with working backwards. Retrosynthetically, what compound do I need here to make this alkyne? There's only a couple reactions we saw last semester that we can use to make alkynes. <clears throat> and those each involved elimination of two leaving groups. So each of these is an E2 reaction. Each of these involves removing beta protons one at a time. So in each one of these three, I would need a strong base. And the base that we described to do that was NH2 minus. It usually comes along with a sodium spectator counter ion. And we said that we would use excess. Using excess of this reactant means there's a molecule of NH2 minus that can pick off one proton that rotates into an antiperiplanar position. That'll swing in and push one leaving group out. So that would make an alkene. And then there's still another hydrogen that's antiperiplanar that. So another molecule of this can pick off that proton and make the alkyne. So we'll just draw that right here real quick. But then if I'm using excess of this NH2 minus, it's also a strong enough base to pick off this proton. So really what I'll end up with before I make the alkyne is a negative charge here. So after adding this base, that would be step one, in step two, I would need some water. And that would just provide the proton to stick on the end of that alkyne. So it doesn't matter whether the two bromines are on this carbon or whether they're on this carbon and I pick off the protons here and eliminate, or whether they're on adjacent carbons and I pick off one proton to eliminate this one and then one proton to eliminate that one. <clears throat> I can use a geminal or vicinal dihalide to make the alkyne. So which makes the most sense? What makes the most sense here is a geminal dihalide. So why can't I use the vicinal one that we just looked at? We just looked at this. I can convert this into an alkyne by using this base to pick off all the protons. The problem is I can't really make this in the context of this synthesis. Right? If I were to imagine trying that, I'd have to figure out how to make that from another reactant. Well, how do I make this type of dihalide where both ha halides are on the same carbon? Well, typically I would make that from an alkyne. And I would add HBr. In this case, it would have to be anti-Markonikov, so I would use peroxides. And I would use excess of that because I'd have to do it twice. I would have to add HBr across there twice to install both bromines. So here, <clears throat> the point is, I can't use this molecule to make it, even though I have the ability to do that by using the conditions we discussed. I can do this reaction, but it won't help me fill in the whole synthesis. Because in order to make this dihalide, I'd have to start with an alkyne. And if I was already there, then I would already be at the final product. There'd be no point in going further. So the idea here is, even though there's multiple options for making an alkyne, only one of them makes sense synthetically because I can make this from a different compound and then start to fill in the rest of these gaps along the way. Right, so that's the idea here. We're working backwards from the final product.
to figure out what could be used to make that product, were the reaction conditions necessary, and then how do I continue to fill in the gaps here to figure out how to make this from the reactants. So a vicinal dihalide is where the halides are on the same carbon. That's usually made from an alkyne by using HBr. <clears throat> So the vicinal dihalide is not going to work here. I need the geminal dihalide where the halogens are on different carbons because I can still do the elimination and make the alkyne. But now I have the possibility of forming that from the reactant and completing the, the whole synthesis. <clears throat> so just to also point out, this arrow is a very specific style arrow, right? So it's not this. It's not this, <clears throat> it's not a curved arrow of any kind. This, <clears throat> it's also not an equilibrium. This arrow specifically means that you're working backwards. It means whatever's on the left-hand side is the product and whatever's on the right-hand side is the reactant. So we're working backwards or retrosynthetically to determine if I want to make this, what do I need to start with? What's the most recent intermediate that I can think of where I know reaction conditions to then convert that into this? Or in other words, this product can be made from this reactant. So if you see that retrosynthetic arrow, that's what's happening, right? So what we're saying here is we can make the desired product from this dihalide, what can we make the dihalide from? Well, last semester we saw if I want two bromines on adjacent atoms, one way to do that, and really the only way we talked about to do that was to start from an alkene. And if I start with an alkene, I can add Br2 across that pi bond. And that would install those two bromines. And then I can do the elimination we just saw to make the alkyne, right? So this is uh, <clears throat> this is the next uh, retro working backwards retrosynthetically. This is the next most recent intermediate that we need to form this one, which will then go on to form the product. And so what reagents do we need here to go from this alkene to the dihalide Br2 in the dark? Right, the, doing it in the dark, make sure that you're not forming radicals and undergoing a radical substitution for one of these hydrogens. Doing it in the dark avoids the formation of radicals and allows the two bromines to add across the pi bond to produce the, the product there. All right, so now we're kind of getting this worked out. If this is the final product working backwards, I can make it from this, and I can make this from an alkene. And we talked about that last semester, right? We, we showed this whole scheme, and we said if I want to make an alkyne from an alkene, the first thing I do is add two bromines across there. And then I use a strong base to eliminate all the bromines. <clears throat> that will also eliminate a proton. So then I need a water to supply that proton that ends up there to make the alkyne. So now <clears throat> we're kind of filling out the synthesis. Working backwards is really helpful in this specific example because there's only a couple ways to make an alkyne and one of those can made, be made from an alkene and so now how do I do this reaction and convert the alcohol into an alkene and so once I've worked back far, far enough now I can kind of see where I'm going there's a lot of different reactions that alcohols can undergo I can make this into a nucleophile and have it attack something I can make it into a leaving group and have it leave and do an elimination. And that's what I see needs to be done here. So now I know of all the reactions an alcohol can undergo, I want to turn it into a leaving group so that, <coughs> excuse me, so that 
that can be kicked out uh, in an elimination reaction to make the alkene, which then can have the Br2 added across it, which then can undergo elimination and produce a product. So <clears throat> what we talked about using the tosyl group last semester to convert an alcohol into a tosylate. We didn't talk about the mechanism. We're still going to talk about that later this semester. <clears throat> but in essence, what happens is the pyridine is acting as a base. And so it will pick off this proton. If the electrons, though, that are shared here leave, uh, stay behind on the oxygen, it's going to make it negative. And that's pretty unstable for such a small atom. So the oxygen will first come in and attack the tosyl and kick out the chloride leaving group, and then the pyridine will pick off this hydrogen. So the hydrogen's gone. And so the purpose of this is to convert this molecule with a OH, which is a poor leaving group, into a tosylate, which is a great leaving group. So just to remind you what that looks like, the oxygen of the tosylate is connected to a sulfur So now if it leaves, the negative charge is stabilized through resonance over three oxygens instead of just leaving and forming a negative on one oxygen. So once I convert that into a leaving group, then I just need a base, a base that can pick off the hydrogen that rotates the antiperiplanar of that leaving group. So then electrons will swing in and push that leaving group out and that'll make the pi bond. So now I've solved that synthesis. I found at least one method to get from point A to point B through these steps. There may be other methods involving other reactions. We've only learned so many reactions at this point. So I obviously wouldn't expect you to solve these uh, unless you're using reactions we already have talked about. But we're going to learn more reactions. So you really want to have mastered the ones we've already covered as thoroughly as possible. And if that requires you to go back and review some stuff from OCHEM 1, that might not be a bad idea. So in your answer, you could just list the steps involved in converting the reactant into the final product of the synthesis. All right, so here's another one. Let's take a look at this one. It's the same type of situation. I want to count the carbons first to see if there's a change in the carbon skeleton. And I see that there is. So I'm going from seven carbons to eight. I have to add another carbon. Later this semester, we're gonna see a variety of ways to add more carbons, but right now we only know one. And that is to start with an alkyne. So if there's only one reaction that this, I know this alkyne is going to undergo in order to extend the carbon chain from 7 to 8 and add another carbon here, then it's not really a big question as to what the first step needs to be. I just have to be familiar enough with that process to know how it works. So how do I add another carbon there? Well, the first thing I need to do is to add a base that's strong enough to pick off this proton, to make this carbon a nucleophile so it can attack carbon-8 and, and make that carbon-carbon uh, connection. So that would pick off this proton. These electrons would stay behind. That would produce a lone pair here and a negative on a carbon, which is pretty unstable and pretty reactive. So that's going to be a great nucleophile. And so if I just need to add one more carbon to the chain, the methyl group just needs to have a leaving group like an iodide or a bromine or something. And so then that carbon and it's negative will come in here and attack the methyl and push the iodine. And so that will give me the same structure in essence, except now I've got an extra methyl group there instead of a hydrogen. So I remove the hydrogen to make the nucleophile, add an electrophile that that carbon can attack. So if I have one carbon attacking another carbon, that creates a new carbon-carbon sigma bond. So now I've got the skeleton correct. I just have to figure out how to get this bond between carbon six and seven to become a single bond and to add two bromines across it. And also, it's helpful, as we said before, 
to draw in the hydrogens because there's no hydrogens initially here on carbon six and seven. So I have to add a hydrogens and bromine. So there's a couple different ways I can do that. If I need to add a hydrogen and a bromine across the pi bond, I can add HBr. At this point, six and seven are very similar. They have similar amounts of sterics, basically the same ability to stabilize a charge. So since there's not really any way to distinguish between them, like there would normally be in a Markonikov versus anti-Markonikov situation, I can't really predict which carbon the bromine will go to and which carbon the hydrogen will go. So it might be random. So that might produce a hydrogen here and a bromine here on some of the structures. And then other structures might end up with the opposite regiochemical outcome. As we said, we need to add hydrogen to each carbon and a bromine to each carbon, and we want to get the correct regiochemical outcome here, or stereochemical outcome with a, a solid wedge and a dash wedge. So if I add another HBr, what will happen? Well, just to point out, now I have a major difference between the two carbons. And if I use HBr on this structure, the hydrogen will go to the carbon that already has more hydrogens and the bromine will go here. So I'd end up with both bromines on the same carbon, which is not the product I want. And if I do the same thing here, I'll get up the same result. So it's, it's going to be difficult to react this with HBr and get a mixture of products and then somehow convert both components of that mixture into the desired product. I can't really do it with HBr. So sometimes you may have an idea, you want to explore the idea. You have to be familiar enough with the mechanism, the regiochemical and stereochemical outcomes to be able to predict whether or not those reagents are going to give you the product you want. In this case, they won't. They're not going to give me the bromines on adjacent atoms. How do I get bromines on adjacent atoms? So we said we can use Na and H2, and then we can use a methyl iodide, and that would convert the reactant into that structure with an extra carbon there. <clears throat> so at this point, maybe I'm not sure how to convert this into the product, but I do know a reaction, so I can also work retrosynthetically, working backwards, I do know how to add two bromines on adjacent carbons if I start with an alkene. So working backwards here, maybe I want this to be an alkene. If it's a cis alkene, then when I add Br2 in the dark, one bromine will form a three-membered ring there. So again, I have to be familiar enough with the mechanism to be able to predict the regiochemical and stereochemical outcome. So when one bromine adds across that pi bond to form a three-membered ring, it could do so above the plane with the solid wedge or with a dashed wedge. Either way, the other Br, which has now a Br minus, is going to attack from the opposite side from where this bromine was initially positioned, right? So this is like an SN2 sort of, like a backside attack. <clears throat> so if this bromine comes in with the solid wedge, the other bromine would come in with the dashed wedge. It would have to come from behind because it's the front position is already blocked. So that could open up the ring and produce a product. However, <clears throat> this these two carbons right here are very similar in sterics and electronics. So there's no way to prevent, prevent the bromine sometimes from coming into this carbon and breaking this sigma bond. If that happened, 
it would produce the same regiochemical outcome, but in that case, the bromines would have the opposite stereochemical configuration, which means I would produce a pair of enantiomers, which I can't avoid. There's no reaction we've talked about that will allow me to avoid that. So that's the best I can do if I want to make this product. I have to make its enantiomer and then try to separate them. That should work though, because if I use Br2 in the dark, it should add across the pi bond, giving me an anti-addition or the stereochemical outcome places the two bromines on the two carbons that used to have the pi bond, pointing in opposite spatial directions. One has a solid wedge, the other has a dash wedge. So now <clears throat> the question is, how do I get from an alkyne to a cis alkene? And again, that's a matter of being familiar enough with the reactions we talked about last semester and the few we've talked about this semester. If I want to go from the alkyne to the alkene, basically I have to install two hydrogens and I have to install them on the same side of the alkene. And so the way to do that is to use H2 with the Lindlar catalyst. If I used H2 with a platinum or palladium catalyst or nickel, there'd be no way to prevent multiple hydrogens from adding across there. So in that situation, I would add four hydrogens or two H2 molecules across that pi bond. So that's not what I want. I only want to add two, not four. So that's the purpose, if you recall, of the Lindlar catalyst. It will allow one molecule of hydrogen to add across the pi bond in a cis configuration, and then it won't catalyze another hydrogenation reaction, so I don't get more hydrogen adding across that pi bond. So that, that's the sequence. First step, remove this proton. Second step, allow the negatively charged carbon to attack a methyl group to add the methyl group. Third step, add the H2 with the Lindlar catalyst. Fourth step, add the Br2 in the dark. And that will produce this pair of enantiomers. And so if I only wanted one of those enantiomers, I'd have to separate them through chirochromatography or some other means to separate molecules that are mirror images rather and, uh, and not superimposable. So as we we're saying, just to remind you, you want to be as uh, familiar as possible with as many reactions as possible. That will help you recognize how to convert one grouping of atoms into another. And definitely keep track of your carbons and your hydrogen atoms because seeing whether hydrogen atoms are removed or added to the structure in addition to whether carbons are removed or added really helps you to um, really helps you uh, to think about what reactions might be necessary so one of the best ways to practice these is to actually try to write questions so there are definitely some questions in the textbook that you should practice in addition to some that I suggested on Monday. There's more at the end of this PowerPoint that are suggested for you to practice. Um, but I think it's definitely worthwhile to write some problems as well because you can kind of see how they're put together and then you have more practice that you can work on the questions that other students have written. So <clears throat> for the quizzes that are due Monday at 1 p.m., those are actually going to be worth 10 points instead of the normal five. So you have to answer the day five quiz questions for Monday as, no, as usual. But I'm also looking for your group as a group to design two synthesis problems as a group. So you'll include the problems and the solutions or the reagents that are necessary to 
can do the synthesis in your Google documents along with your day five quiz questions. And then I'll take a look at them if any of them are any good. I will give them to another group to solve. And I'll, so after day five, when I look at your quizzes and grade them, you'll probably see another synthesis problem or two pop up on your Google document. And so I'll expect you to solve that synthesis problem that another group wrote um, in addition to uh, <clears throat> the one you wrote for the full quiz credit. So if anyone <clears throat> has any questions about that, let me know. So when you're writing synthesis problems, the basic strategy for writing a synthesis problem is start with a simple structure, use a reaction you know that structure undergoes, draw the product. Then think of another reaction. It could be the same one, could be a different reaction that that product undergoes and draw the product of that. And then another reaction that that undergoes and draw the product of that. <clears throat> and then when you're, when I present your problem to a different group, it will just be the reactant and the product. And the other group will have to figure out what reagents are necessary. So what I'll be looking for you to do when you write the problem is to show me all your work. That way I can check to make sure the reactions are reasonable and I'll actually give the products. And then I can just give that problem to another group. So I'll be asking you to write a couple problems and for your group to probably solve a couple of those problems. So hopefully that will be good extra practice going into uh, the <clears throat> next exam that we're going to have on that content the following week. A lot of times there's more than one way to solve these. So I'll definitely obviously be looking at your answers and if your answers are different from the ones I expected, as long as they reasonably could produce the product that you're trying to make, then you should be able to get credit for that. So here's just an example that illustrates that. If you recall the hydroboration oxidation reaction, it's a two-step process. It gives anti-Markonikov addition across a pi bond specifically hydration. So you're adding a hydrogen and an OH in a way that is the opposite regiochemical outcome from what Markonikov would have predicted, right? Markonikov predicts that if you're adding a hydrogen, it should go to the carbon that already had more hydrogens, which would be this one. So if I did a Markonikov hydration, the hydrogen would end up here and the OH would end up here. But I don't want that. The product is an anti-Markonikov result. So I need the one way to do that is a um, <clears throat> hydroboration, oxidation reaction uh, across that pi bond. Another way to do that <clears throat> would be to add HBr anti-Markonikov. So if I add step one here to this molecule, so if I add HBr, I would normally expect the hydrogen to go here and the Br to go here. But if I use the peroxides, I get the anti-Markonikov addition through the free radical mechanism that we talked about there at the end of chapter 11. And so that would result in this product and then you may recognize that this is a great leaving group it's on a primary carbon it's not too sterically hindered for a nucleophile to come in in an SN2 and knock it out and so if the nucleophile I want to replace is an OH all I have to do is add OH minus that will come in and push out the bromine and give me the product so there's more than one way to convert that alkene into the alcohol <clears throat> through an anti-Markonikov regiochemical outcome. All right, so here was the synthesis that y'all were looking at for today's quiz question, the first part of it. So this is a, definitely a tricky one. We've got five carbons here to begin with. 
and we're adding two more carbons. It's not, the two carbons we're adding are not connected through a carbon-carbon bond, right? There's this oxygen joining thing. So that's a little bit different from what we saw when we were doing the alkyne and we could pick off a proton from the alkyne using a base and then we could add another carbon group like an ethyl group with the leaving group to extend the carbon chain. So when we did that, it extended the carbon chain by forming a carbon-carbon bond. Here, I'm extending the carbon chain through a carbon-oxygen bond. So, <clears throat> what are some ideas for how to solve this? Well, clearly, <clears throat> on carbon-1, initially I've got an OH there, and then later I want to replace that with a hydrogen. So if I want to get this OH out of here, there's really only one way to do that, and that is to make it into a better leaving group. I can't protonate it with an, uh, an acid and then expect it to leave because a primary carbocation would be too unstable. So I'm not going to use an acid to protonate it and make it into a water leaving group. I'm going to use tosyl chloride and pyridine. That will convert that OH into an OTS. Now it's a great leaving group. It's not going to just leave because, as we said, the primary carbocation would be too unstable. That would require really strong and unlikely collisions to occur because the transition state through which it would have to go to get to that primary carbocation is really high in energy prohibitively high in energy, so it wouldn't, it wouldn't happen that way. So what I would need next is a base, an ethoxide, methoxide, terputoxide, doesn't really matter because since the leaving group's on the end of the chain, there's only one beta carbon. And so once one of these hydrogens on the beta carbon rotates into a position that's anti-planar to that leaving group, any strong base with an oxygen that has a negative charge, whether it be attached to a methyl, ethyl, propyl, terpyl, or whatever, should be able to pick off that proton. As I said, once it rotates into the periplane of the leaving group, it can push that in and push out the leaving group. So the next intermediate would be the alkene that would result from elimination then. And so does that help me get toward the product? Yeah, because now I can add across this alkene. I can make sure I add a hydrogen to carbon one. And I can make sure I add an oxygen to carbon two. So how do I add a hydrogen and an oxygen across a pi bond? Well, there are a few different ways to do that, and I have to make sure I get the correct regiochemical outcome. So if I'm going to add a hydrogen here and an oxygen there, do I want it to be Markonikov or anti Markonikov? I want the next hydrogen to add to the carbon, carbon 1, that already has more hydrogens. So I'm looking for a Markonikov hydration, and there are two sets of conditions for that. I can do a Markonikov hydration with H3O plus and water. If that happens, the pi bond will start by picking up a proton and it will make a carbocation. That carbocation would be secondary and what that means is a hydride shift would occur every time I form a carbocation. I want to look for a hydride or methyl shift that could make the carbocation more stable. And so since that secondary carbocation could become tertiary, then the water would end up attacking there and I would get my oxygen at carbon three, which is not what I want. So this is not the correct conditions to do the, these are Markonikov hydration conditions, but these conditions allow for the possibility of a rearrangement, which I want to avoid. So last semester we talked about a way to do a Markonikov hydration without the possibility of rearrangement. And that involved 
the mercury acetate. If you recall, the mercury <clears throat> forms a three-membered ring across, across that pi bond. I'm running out of space down there, so I'm going to draw that up here. So if I have a pi bond, and I've got a mercury acetate, the mercury has a lone pair, it brings the lone pair in, and the pi bond forms the second bond. So that allows the mercury to form a three-membered ring. It's very similar to when I have a bromine or an oxygen here. It starts to pull the electrons, and especially starts to pull them away from the carbon that can better stabilize a positive, which is going to be the secondary versus the primary due to hyperconjugation. So that makes this carbon susceptible to attack from a nucleophile. What nucleophile do I want to attack carbon to? I want this nucleophile, an oxygen with two carbons. So that's what I add, an OH with two carbons. This is carbon six and seven. So this is a modified version of the reaction we saw last semester. So this is one answer. You may not have come up with this answer because this modified version of that reaction isn't really discussed in this textbook until chapter 13, 14. You haven't really seen it yet. So I'm just pointing that out now as an option, and we'll talk about one other option to solve this as well. So if I run this reaction, that will allow this ethyl group or eth uh, ethanol group to attack this carbon even though it's more sterically hindered, because the mercury is already starting to pull electrons away, it creates a large uh, partial positive here, which the oxygen is attracted to and will come in and attack and open up that ring. So what that will end up giving you is a mercury here, the oxygen with the hydrogen and an ethyl group. Then another ethanol, we'll depronate that. So you won't have a proton there anymore. <clears throat> and then in the mercuric uh, reaction that we saw last semester, the next step was to add NaBH4. Then HBA4 replaces the mercury with the hydrogen. So this set of conditions <clears throat> is one potential answer. These two steps make the alkene these two steps do the Markonikov addition across that alkene where I end up with no possibility of rearrangement because the mercury is stabilizing that positive charge enough. I'm not going to see this hydrogen jump over to create the tertiary carbocation because that's less stable than only a partial charge when I have a full charge. And so that draws in the nucleophile. And I specifically choose this nucleophile because I want to install an oxygen with two carbons. And then the last step just replaces the mercury with the hydrogen. Any questions about that approach? Okay, so I didn't necessarily expect anyone to come up with that. I didn't expect anyone to be looking ahead at chapter 14. So the approach I maybe would have expected to see would have involved uh, some reactions that we, uh, some groups did in lab last semester and we talked a little bit about last semester. So the first two steps, I would have probably expected you to do the same thing. To put the tosylate leaving group there and then to eliminate it with some kind of alkoxide strong base that would produce the alkene. So making the alkenes probably really your, the only thing you're going to do with this oxygen if you need to get rid of the OH and put a hydrogen on there. If you need to get rid of it, you need to make it a leaving group and eliminate it and make an alkene. So if, <clears throat> the other option is to just do the Markonikov hydration. So again, we can't use water in H3O plus because we'll get the rearrangement. So if we use Markonikov hydration conditions with water, which is the nucleophile that was discussed when we looked at this reaction last semester, and follow that with NaBH4, 
steps three and four there, we'll simply do the Marconica hydration without the possibility of rearrangement. I'm actually going to put this hydrogen here. So now the question is, how do I convert this OH into an OET? So I can remove the hydrogen with a base. And I saw in some of your work, you wanted to use an ethanol or an alcohol as a base, and you wanted to have one alcohol deprotonate another alcohol. That is not going to work because this alcohol that picks up the proton is going to be quite unstable with a formal positive. And this alcohol that loses the proton is going to be quite unstable with a formal negative. And so that would really just result in this oxygen picking the proton back and going back. That reaction would not favor the products in an equilibrium. You can't really do that. I need a much stronger base to pull off this hydrogen. And last semester, one of the strongest bases we talked about that really only reacts as a base is a hydride. So that would be a good bet here. Sodium hydride, one group used this uh, reagent in their reaction in lab where <clears throat> they wanted to make that ether product from lab six because the hydride is a much better base than an alcohol or even an alkoxide. A negative on a hydrogen being such a small atom creates a really large charge imbalance. So this negative would definitely pick up that proton. These electrons would stay behind and that would produce, so this is just a point I was making, so that would produce an alkoxide. So we got the correct regiochemical positioning of this oxygen by using the Markonikoff hydration conditions that don't allow for rearrangement. Then we're making that oxygen into a nucleophile by removing its proton and making it negative with something that's even more unstable as a negative. And so then the last step would be adding that ethyl group with the leaving group like a bromine or an iodine or something, and we'd be able to get that to attack and an SN2 to install those last two carbons on that oxygen to make the product. And there's probably a few other ways to do that synthesis. So I'll definitely be looking at your quiz answers and potentially giving you suggestions or critiques and feedback on that. Questions about that one? All right, so that brings us now into chapter 13. So there's definitely going to be some kind of synthesis you're probably going to have to deal with uh, coming up soon. So the more practice you have with that, the better, and there are going to continue to be synthesis problems throughout the semester. As we learn more, more reactions, I'll expect you to be able to use those to solve syntheses. So the more practice you get on that, the more effective your problem solving strategies are now, the easier it will be to incorporate new reactions in, in those strategies later. So we're going to look at some alcohols and phenols and some of the reactions and, and properties that they have. So we've talked about alcohols a fair amount. We know alcohols possess this OH group. Uh, really almost any carbon can bond to an OH group. It's a pretty stable bond between a carbon and an oxygen. And so you can put an OH group on an ethyl group. You can put it on a cyclopentane. And there are tons of natural products, natural compounds that are made by different plants and animals that have OH groups in a variety of different positions. Uh, lots of them are uh, present in humans and in the environment, a variety of different 
um, potential uses in society. So we want to be familiar with these OH groups. When you have an OH group directly attached to an aromatic ring, that creates its own name because this OH group undergoes different reactions from, say, this OH group. When my OH group is attached to an alkane versus an aromatic ring, it's got significantly different reactions. Some similarities, for sure, but enough of a difference that they decide to give it its own name. So that's why we have alcohols and phenols. Technically, a phenol is an alcohol, right? An alcohol is any time I have an OH connected to a carbon. But if that's part of an aromatic ring, there's some special reactions and properties that it might have. And so they give that a special name as well. And there's lots of different phenols that exist. It's a pretty common functional group. So we're going to talk about both al uh, alcohols in general and some specific alcohols uh, called phenols. And like anytime we talk about new reactions or new uh, functional groups, we want to start off by making sure that we can properly name them using the IPEC system. So these are the steps for naming compounds using the IAPAC system that we talked about last semester in the context of alkenes and alkenes and alkyl halides and alkynes. And so now we're just going to expand that to deal with the situation where we have an alcohol. So one key thing is your parent chain should be the longest chain of carbons that are connected, but it should include the OH group. And we want to give the OH group the lowest number possible. So if I've got some long chain, maybe there's a bromine over here and a chlorine or something like that. If there's an OH group here, I really have to start numbering the chain from the side that gives the OH group the lowest number, regardless of what other groups are there. There are other groups that can take priority of the OH, but none that we've talked about so far. So as far as we're concerned at this point, the OH group is a top priority when it comes to numbering the parent chain, deciding which side to number it from. So here are some examples. So obviously if I take pentane and I add an, OL, uh, an OH group to the end of it, it's still one, two, three, four, five carbons. So I change the suffix to an ol and that communicates that there's an alcohol attached there there's no number so i could say one pentanol or i could say pent and one all those two names are also correct they communicate that it's carbon one that the oh groups attached to but if I just write pentanol, that's also okay because if there's no number shown, it's assumed that the functional group is connected to the first carbon of the chain. As we were saying a moment ago, your parent chain should include the carbon that the OH is attached to. Right? So if I have an OH here, I would not find the longest chain of carbons necessarily. I would find the longest chain of carbons that actually includes the carbon that the oxygen is attached to and then I would number it from that side. So that's how I get hexanol as my parent and then I would have a propyl group attached to carbon 2 of the hexanol. So it would be 2-propyl hexanol for the name of that structure. Again, just to reiterate, if I've got a different functional group and it's competing with OH, if my goal is to give the alkene the lowest number possible, I would number from right to left. But the OH takes precedence or priority over the alkene. So I have to number from the side that gives the OH the lowest number. So what would the name of this structure be? I'd have a methyl group on five and another methyl group on five. So that'd be a five, five, oops, five comma five. 
time at all. I've got seven total carbons. Oh, wait, I have a methyl on six. So it really should be five, five, six trimethyl. I've got an OH on two, and I've got an alkene between six and seven. So I need a number to locate the alkene on six, and I need a number to locate the OH on two. So I could do six. Heptene to all. And so because there's an alkene, I need the ene suffix. And I need a number in front of that somewhere to tell me which carbon the alkene starts on. And then just to prevent confusion, I just put the number that the alcohol is connected to right in front of the alcohol suffix so that there's no confusion about which carbon the alcohol is on and which carbon the alkene is on. Alternatively, I could have also put hept, hept 6 en to all. So I can also put the number right before the suffix for both of those functional groups, that would also be correct. Um, as always, if there's a chiral center, you have to determine if it's RRS and put that out in front of the name. So there's some examples of that. Most of the time people don't have too much trouble with that here in the second semester. There's also some common names. Isopropyl alcohol is the same as 2-propanol, right? Propanol has three carbons. It's 2-propanol because the OH is on carbon 2. So each of these, you don't have to memorize these common names, but you just want to be aware that you won't always see the name is exactly what you would predict using the IUPAC system. These common names are still in use commonly because they were so frequently used before the IUPAC system was developed. And, you know, people just continue to communicate using terms that they're already familiar with. We also can talk about alcohols as being on a primary carbon a secondary carbon or a tertiary carbon. And that's important because of sterics, because of the fact that if it were converted into a leaving group, it wouldn't be able to leave behind like a primary carbocation versus it would for a secondary or tertiary. And that's like electronics. Um, and so since those two issues are so important in predicting the outcomes of reactions and what molecules are more reactive or go through lower energy transition states than others. This terminology is definitely used a lot and it helps to explain why some molecules undergo reactions more readily than others. So we want to just be aware when it comes to an alcohol, if it's primary, it means it's attached to a primary carbon. Secondary, it means it's attached to a secondary carbon. To remind you, that's different from amines. We talked about amines a little bit last semester when we were talking about IR. We said an amine involves a nitrogen, and if amine is primary, it's not necessarily connected to a primary carbon, it means it's connected to one carbon, and that the other things bonded to it are hydrogen, in addition to the lone pair it needs to balance out its formal charge. So the carbon that the nitrogen is attached to in a primary amine, it could be a primary carbon, it could be secondary, it could be tertiary, it doesn't matter. What's important is the number of carbons attached to the amine. So just to contrast that with alcohols, a secondary amine has two carbon groups and a tertiary amine has three carbon groups. And so since nitrogen can form up to three bonds, it makes sense to use the primary, secondary, tertiary terminology to refer to how many carbons are bonded to the nitrogen. But for oxygen, it can form up to two bonds. And if it's an alcohol, 
one of those bonds will always be with a hydrogen. So really it only has one bond. So there's no way to have like two or three carbons bonded to that oxygen and still have it bonded to the hydrogen. So instead we look at the carbon and see how many uh, other carbons are bonded to that carbon as a primary, are there two making it secondary or are there three making it tertiary? All right, when it comes to a phenol, as we said, that's when the OH group is bonded directly to an aromatic ring, six-membered ring with alternating double and single bonds that engage in resonance to stabilize the pi electrons over all six of those atoms at once. The word phenol is different from the word phenol by one letter, and that one letter makes a big difference. So phenyl has the YL suffix. That indicates that it's a substituent. As a substituent, it would occur you know, somewhere along the parent chain. So if this were to, if I had a phenyl group, which is really just an aromatic ring as a side group on carbon three, that would be three phenyl no name. Right, so the phenyl indicates a substituent that's attached to some parent chain. The word phenol is not a substituent. It's a parent itself. And when you see the word phenol, that tells you that the, uh, the parent of the molecule includes both the ring and the OH group. Right, so here I have it at the end of the name because it's representing the parent and that includes all of this the ring and the oh group are all included when you say the word phenol and so then you just have to locate and alphabetize the chlorine that's on carbon four and the nitro that's on carbon two so that's why it's four chloro two nitro phenol all right so let's do a little practice here with naming so I want to name the structure. My priorities are to make sure the OH carbon that it's bonded to is part of my parent chain. So I'm not going to number the parent chain over here and exclude that carbon. I want to make the longest chain of connected carbons, including that carbon. And I want to give the OH group the lowest number possible. So I'm definitely going to start here with one so that the lowest, so that the carbon the OH is on is the lowest number possible, but still giving myself the longest chain that includes that carbon. And so from three, I could go four, five, or I could go four, five, six. So obviously that's longer. Plus I still also want the alkene carbons to be included in my parent chain as well. So the parent chain here is hex, There's an alkene, so it's hexene. And the alkene starts on carbon three, so I could put that three right there if I wanted, or I could do three hexene. I also have an alcohol, it's on carbon two. So I need the OL suffix. And that tells me the alcohol is on carbon two of my parent chain. So either of these is a correct way to show the parent chain that includes six carbons, has an alkene bridging carbon three and four, and an alcohol on carbon two. So now I want to name my substituents. I've got three isopropyl. You could also call that three methyl ethyl, if you didn't want to use the common name. I've got a chloro on five, and I've got a bromo on five. Those are my substituents. So I don't want to alphabetize those. The bromo comes before chloro, which comes before isopropyl. So I would have five bromo, five chloro, three isopropyl. Oops. Isopropyl. 
hex 3 in too long. So once I account for the parent chain, the groups that are attached to the parent chain that are part of the parent name, and the substituents, I always have to look for stereochemistry. Are there chiral centers that need to be labeled as RRS? And are there alkenes that need to be labeled as E or Z? If so, that goes out in the front of the name, which I don't have any space, so I'm just going to write that here instead. So how many chiral centers here are there? Carbon 2 is chiral, and carbon 5 is chiral. And to be a chiral center, hopefully you remember, that carbon has to have four different atoms or groups of atoms connected to it. So carbon 2 has a methyl, an OH, a hydrogen, and then the rest of the structure. Those are all four different. So I prioritize the groups based on atomic number from the periodic table. Oxygen has a higher atomic number than carbon. Carbon has the same atomic number than car as carbon. So then I have to look at what's attached to the carbon. Here there's just hydrogens, which have low atomic numbers. Here there's carbons, which have more atomic, higher atomic numbers. So this would be priority one for having the highest atomic number for the atom that's immediately attached to the chiral center. This would be priority two, because the elements attached to it have a higher priority than the elements attached up here on priority group three. Once I realize priority group four is already pointing away from me, then I just go clockwise or counterclockwise in this case, 1 to 2 to 3 is counterclockwise. So that tells me that carbon 2 has an S configuration. Looking at carbon 5, I've got, in this case, bromine as the high highest atomic number. Right? It's got 35 protons. Chlorine has 17. Carbon has 12, uh, 6, I mean. And carbon, uh, oops. So these two carbons have the same atomic number. This one has hydrogens bond to it. This one has a carbon. So this would be a higher priority. And this would be the lowest priority. So when the lowest priority is in the plane of the paper, instead of pointing out at me or pointing away, that's a tricky situation. There's some strategies we can deal, use to deal with that. Last semester, we talked about swapping two groups. So if I were to swap those two groups, this is priority two. If I put priority four where the bromine is, and the bromine here, priority one, where the methyl group was, basically swapping two groups gives me the opposite configuration. So now that the fourth priority group is pointing away, I can go counterclockwise, which means this one is S, but before they were swapped, it must have been R. So that tells me that carbon five is an R. Another way to do that is to make a model of it or imagine it in three dimensions in my mind and just rotate the molecule in space so that the fourth parent group is pointing away without swapping them. And I would also find out that the configuration is an R if I do that. All right, so we're almost done here. We need now an E or Z configuration to communicate how the groups are configured around the alkene. Since I wrote all over the structure, I'm going to redraw the relevant part of it up here so we can talk about whether this alkene has an E or Z configuration. So to do that, I find one of the two carbons involved in the double bond, prioritize the crew two groups there. This one has a higher priority because the first element carbon is the same but the next element here is an oxygen, whereas down here is just carbon. On the other carbon of the double bond, obviously the hydrogen is a lower priority than a carbon. And so when the two top priority groups are on the same side, that's Z. So the full name of this would be 2S5RZ, 5-bromo, 5-chloro, 3-isopropyl, then hex 3 in 2 all or 3 hexene 2 all. All right, so hopefully you can get through that type of analysis on an exam question. I might also ask you to draw the structure from the name. And that's usually easier because 
then you can just look at the end of the name and figure out what the parent chain is. And it's a cyclohex. So I've got six carbons in a ring, cyclohex. And then I've got two alcohols. Di means two, OL means alcohol. And so these two numbers are telling me which carbons of the ring the two alcohols are on, carbon one and four. So if this is one, two, three, four. So one, four, cyclohexene, cyclohexadiol. I've also got on carbon one, an isopropyl group. So there's my isopropyl group, it's looking a little weird. Probably should have given that a little bit different angle. The angle's a little tight there, but it's still an isopropyl group. And the cis tells me stereochemically that the identical groups are on the same side. So I can give both of these a dashed wedge or both of these a solid wedge. So this one could be correctly drawn in either of these ways. It's the same thing. Flip the molecule over like a pancake, it lies directly on the other one. So I don't have to draw both. Just pointing out that you can draw it either way. Both of these are cis because both involve identical groups on the same spatial side of the ring. All right, so <clears throat> that brings us to the other two quiz questions from today that we're naming some molecules. So here we wanted to name this one. So again, we want the OH group to be on the parent chain and we want to give it the lowest number. So I'm definitely going to start numbering the parent chain here. I can't number the parent chain to include the ring and carbons outside the ring. There's no way to account for that in the naming system. So the ring is going to have to be a substituent, which pretty much everyone got in their quiz answers that I looked at. And I just want to keep going to find the longest chain possible. So my parent chain has an alcohol on carbon one and an alkene starting on carbon three and it's six carbons long. So again, that's hex, three ene, one all, or three hex ene, one all. Now I've got to account for the substituents. I've got methyl groups on four and five and I've got a cyclopentyl, right? it's a cyclo ring, it's got five carbons on carbon three. Again, my substituents always have to have a YL suffix if they're alkyl groups or carbon groups. And the cyclopentyl has a alphabetic priority over the methyl. So I would start with that alphabetic three cyclopentyl, four, five, dimethyl, and then I need a hyphen there, three hexene one all or hex three ene one all. Once I account for the parent and all the substituents, I want to look for chiral centers or alkenes that have a cis trans or easy configuration. So here there are no chiral centers anywhere but there is an alkene and I have to prioritize the groups here to determine if it's E or Z. So on this carbon of the alkene, I've got a carbon with two hydrogens and a carbon. The OH is not relevant if there's a difference that I can find before I get that far away from the center I'm prioritizing the groups from. So here, in this direction, I've got a carbon that has a hydrogen and two carbon. So comparing these two priority-wise, they're the same here and here, but there's a difference where the hydrogen matches up against a carbon, so that's a higher priority. So this would be priority one, and this would be priority two. On the other side, the isopropyl group has more carbons, and the methyl group has more hydrogen, so the isopropyl group is a priority. So again, if the priority groups are on the same side, that's Z. 
that in front of the name. And I've got that one completed. So for the second quiz question that involved naming, here I want to draw the structure from the name. So I'm looking at the parent name to start with that. And my parent name involves a cyclohex. So I've got six carbons. Three, five, cyclohexa diene. Diene means I've got two enes, or two carbon-carbon double bonds. One starts on carbon three. Bridging three and four. And the other starts on carbon five. Bridging five and six. So I'll just redraw that. It looks a little cluttered from the numbers. So I have a double bond here and here. And this is carbon one. And this is carbon two. So then I've also got one, two diol in my parent name. So carbon one and two both have an OH group. And then I've got on carbon one, a three, three dimethyl butyl. So when I have a substituent parentheses, hopefully you recall, I wanna start at the end of the parentheses. Just like when I start drawing the molecule, I start at the end with the parent name. So this is like a sub parent. On carbon one, I've got a butyl group, one, two, three, four. And on that butyl group, there are two methyls on carbon three of the butyl group, right? These threes are not outside the parentheses. If the threes are outside the parentheses, they'd be referring to carbon three of the parent. But they're inside the parentheses, which means they're referring to carbon three of the butyl. So one, two, three, two methyl groups on three. So on carbon one, I've got this 3,3-dimethylbutyl. I've got an OH. On carbon two, I've got an OH. But then I have to look here to decide how to put the dashes and wedges to make the correct stereochemical outcome. So on carbon one, I've got an R configuration. So let's just see, what if I made this one a solid wedge and this one a dashed wedge? If I did that, the priorities would be one, two, three, right? The oxygen is a higher priority than any carbon that's attached because it has a higher atomic number than carbon. This carbon has an oxygen attached, which has a higher priority than any of the carbons that are attached to the other one. So that's two. This carbon here has a hydrogen and the equivalent of two carbons because of the double bond. This carbon here has two hydrogens and one carbon. So that's why it's a higher priority over this fourth priority group. So if the fourth priority group is pointing away and I go clockwise, that makes that one R. So that one, I just kind of guessed and it came out to be R. So I'll just you know, make sure that I draw the wedges and dashes accordingly. And then for carbon two, that one also has to be R. So what if I made that a solid wedge? Would it be R? If not, I just swap it and make it a dash wedge and that'll make it R. So here the top priority is the oxygen. This carbon here has a hydrogen. The other carbon has an oxygen. So that's clearly the second priority. So let me redraw that. It's getting a little cluttered now. So we've got this OH, we're imagining it with a solid wedge just to see how the configuration would come out. Priority one, priority two, priority three, and obviously the hydrogen that's here would be priority four. So if it did have a solid wedge and the hydrogen had a dash wedge, it would be counterclockwise and that would be S, but it should be R. So I just need the opposite. So I'm just gonna have that OH group point away instead. And so that should give me the correct structure for that name. So hopefully you uh, are pretty good with naming. If not, you definitely want to practice uh, that as well because you may have a question about naming. 
And then the uh, textbook covers some kind of uh, relevant, but not the type of content I usually ask questions about. So I'm not going to expect you to just memorize some facts about how many gallons of methanol are made industrially. This is just to kind of make things relevant to you from a real world perspective and to give you some ideas of the uses of some of these simple alcohols, the ones that are most common. Ethanol is the only alcohol that humans consume, only simple alcohol that humans consume. Um, obviously, consumption of ethanol in large quantities is poisonous and it can obviously have really terrible health effects. So that's information about that. And obviously isopropanol is a household cleaner. It's an antiseptic. Uh, it's also very poisonous, even more so. You shouldn't drink it at all, even in the slightest. Um, but uh, those simple alcohols, you know, just to give you a sense for how much of them is used uh, on the regular, um, even though those numbers aren't very relatable, uh, those compounds are extremely important uh, to our economy. So that's just a little background information there. So then the next topic we'll want to discuss briefly here are some physical properties. Y'all should be pretty familiar with this already from Gen Chem and some of the topics earlier from last semester. We know that if you have an OH group, there's a big electronegativity difference between oxygen and hydrogen. So if I'm thinking about ethanol and its polarity, the oxygen pulls electrons away from both the carbon and the hydrogen creating some large partial positives and a large partial negative. So that allows that structure to form hydrogen bonds and attract to a neighboring structure. So the attractions between the structure means it takes a much higher energy to separate them from one another, right? The chlorine is also fairly electronegative and it creates some dipoles. But the attractions that form between molecules of this are much weaker and it's boiled well below room temperature. It's a gas at room temperature. If you don't have any of those attractions and you just have a nonpolar structure that can only form partial charges through random shifting of electrons through London forces, and those are only temporary, well, then another molecule of that's going to form very weak attractions. So the boiling point is very, very low. And that's very difficult to get it to condense into a liquid. You have to cool it way down. So the particles really, really slow down before their attractions will start to clump them together into a liquid versus a gas. So I might ask you to rank boiling points. We did a lot of that last semester. Same thing this semester, focusing on the types of intermolecular attractions, the quantities of partial charge, whether or not the partial charge is permanent due to the dipole or an electronegativity difference versus the partial charge only being temporary due to random shifting of electrons. Those things all factor into how strongly the molecules will attract one another. And I would expect you to think about and explain those topics on an exam question if I ask you to rank boiling points. We also know that um, <clears throat> solubility in water and other polar solvents is enhanced uh, by having OH groups. Right, so if water or an alcohol has these large partial charges, they can attract, uh, allow for mixing to occur between substances. However, the bigger the R group is, the less likely it is for it to be soluble or miscible in water. Right, so <clears throat> methanol, where I have only one carbon attached to an alcohol, is fully miscible in water. Any ratio of alcohol of this methanol and water that I add together will fully mix. Uh, and that's because of these strong intermolecular forces, the hydrogen bonds that can form between the oxygen and the hydrogen on the methanol with the oxygen and the hydrogen of the water molecule. Once this chain is four or more carbons, especially if it's a lot more carbons, 
Now I have a situation where water molecules can form nice hydrogen bonds with the OH group of the alcohol, including the hydrogen's partial positive attracting to the partial negative of a water, and the oxygen's partial negative attracting to the partial positive of a water. But the rest of the structure, if it's low in polarity or nonpolar altogether, it's only going to be able to form temporary partial charges through random shifting of the electron cloud. And the carbons have their electrons in the second energy level. So they're pretty strongly attracted. They don't shift around very readily. So this part of the molecule can only form very small temporary partial charges. And water molecules could come in and form some weak attractions there but they have such large partial charges, it's much easier and stronger if they attract to one another. So if this were surrounded by water molecules and the water molecules are forming these weak attractions with this low polarity area, they'd be probably much more likely to just force that molecule out and find one another so that they can form stronger attractions. So the water molecules kind of zip up and attract one another and force these low polarity structures out. So when you see the word hydrophobic, it implies that there's some kind of repulsion or fear of water that this low polarity group has. It's not technically true. They're still able to attract. It's just that it's much weaker than the attraction between the large partial charges on the water molecules. So the water molecules zip up together and force that low polarity area out of the out of the water and that's why for an alcohol to be fully miscible in water and mixed together readily with water in any ratio you have to have three or less carbons so these propanol ethanol or propanol or isopropanol those are fully miscible in water but once you get to butanol the carbon chain is low enough in polarity that it won't attract well with water. And there's some solubility, but it's not fully miscible. It won't form one clear layer. You'll see some separation or some bubbles or droplets of one in the other. Any questions about any of that? All right, so one other property of alcohols is that they are relatively good antibacterial agents. So you're probably familiar with a lot of hand sanitizer. Obviously, we're all using that a lot lately. That contains ethanol because ethanol is relatively cheap. There's industrial methods for making it. But if ethanol has two carbons. It's definitely not the best alcohol against uh, bacteria because the potency with which ethanol will kill a bacteria is limited because it's so polar. Right? So to make an alcohol the best antibacterial agent, it's got to have some water solubility because bacteria live in water. Pretty much, as far as I know, almost every bacterium lives somehow surrounded by water. So if I've got some water droplets that has a bacterium in there, if I add an antibacterial agent that can't dissolve in water, then it would just sit on the top. It wouldn't mix in. It wouldn't inter even interact with the bacterium in order to kill it. So it's not going to be potent if there are too many carbons and it's too insoluble in water to even mix into the water and interact with the bacterium. It's not going to kill it. If the carbon chain is too short, one, two, three, four, five carbons, we're talking about not very potent antibacterial agents compared to the ones that have seven, eight, nine carbons. If the carbon group is relatively short, then you have a situation where it won't enter the bacterium. The bacterium will have a cell membrane that prevents it from getting in. And so if you think about a cell membrane, 
of a bacterium, that cell membrane consists of some charged oxygen atoms usually, and then a long chain of carbons, and those line up, and then it forms like a bilayer. And so if I've got this bacterium and it's protecting its DNA and everything on the inside of this bilayer, in order to penetrate that and start interfering with the reactions and life processes of the bacterium, I need a structure that can pass through the non-polar or low polarity middle of that cell membrane. So I need a structure that has a relatively low polarity region. So through random collisions, it can collide with the cell membrane and get in there and then pass through to the other side. And if it's too polar, like ethanol or methanol, and it's got too much of these partial charges, it's just gonna attract on the outside. Like that's the purpose of the cell membrane, to keep certain things out. And if they can't, if they don't have both a polar feature to attract to water to get mixed into the same solution and a nonpolar feature to get into the cell membrane, it's going to be difficult for it to pass into the cell unless the cell has some kind of active transport evolved uh, to, uh, to uptake that particular molecule. So uh, hexyl resorcinol is a great antibacterial agent also an antifungal agent for the same reason. It's got a, a, a nice long non-polar region that can interact with the cell membrane. It's got a couple polar groups that can attract to water. So it has a decent solubility in water and also the ability to pass uh, over a cell membrane or through a cell membrane in order to get inside uh, a bacteria and, and kill the bacteria. All right, so that's what we needed to get through. So again, some of this stuff is um, obviously conceptual and might require you to give a little bit of an explanation. A lot of that's review from last semester and from Gen Chem, so you want to still be familiar with that. Um, there's a problems to, for you to practice naming, uh, but the synthesis here is really going to be the biggest issue probably where you'll need practice. So don't forget that there might be questions asked on some of this other stuff when, oh, this is not going to be exam one. That needs to be updated. Um, this should be exam two. So when you take exam two, uh, be prepared for questions on any one of these bullet points. And so there's plenty of practice here in chapter 12 and 13 for you to work through. Let me know if you have questions. And then don't forget for day five, the quiz. I'll be looking for you, for your group, to uh, write two synthesis problems, and then I'll um, distribute those to other groups so you get a little extra practice in. All right. So we're going to continue Chapter 13, talking about alcohols, uh, on Monday. Any questions about anything? Does anyone have any questions?